Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the chance to be here in your house, and I just pray, God, that you would guide us as we look at your word. Lord, help me to teach it well in a way that is first and foremost accurate to your intent and is impacts us, Lord, helps us to think through what it means to be part of your church and what your purpose for having us here is. And Lord, I just pray you'll use this message in a powerful way for your glory, and I just pray you'll guide me as I seek to teach your word well and definitely need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, if you would. Acts chapter 2, and last week we started a new series on the local church. Um, the plan for this is to look at the church in general and what God's teaching is about the church. Talked about last week how, how many people see the church as optional in the Christian life. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of ways Satan attacks it. He attacks us by keeping us too busy to be part of the church as, as, as God intended. But he has also attacked the very idea of church, both to, on one hand, make us think it's just an optional thing, we'll fit in if we have time, and on the other hand, to corrupt the church as God intended it, both by wrong doctrine being taught from the pulpit, but even, even more um, uh, you know, hard to spot than that is just a wrong idea of what a church is about. And, and Sunday morning services have taken a different form because people's understanding of why we meet as a church has become incorrect. And I wanted to correct that, first of all, by, by stressing the fact last week that the church is God's idea. It's not some man-made idea. It's not the product of American history. It's not the product of, of you know, medieval history or ancient history from 300 AD, but it is the product of God's eternal plan. And in a sense, there was the, the seeds of what a church would look like back in the days of Israel. But the church began on the day of Pentecost, and that's where I want to take us to Acts chapter 2 to, to not just talk about whose idea the church was, but, but since it was God's idea, the fact we, we laid out last week, last message, what's God's intent for the church? What should the church be doing? What should a church gathering look like? What, what should be in our mind, when we think about the fact that we are part of the church of God, what does that mean and, and how should we act? And so we're going to talk about understanding our identity as God's people this morning. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We also looked at this verse last week, Ephesians 2.19. So you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of, and think about this, the household of God members of the household of God. The church is God's idea, not man-made. It began before the foundation of the world in the mind of God and in his eternal plan. It's been part of his big plan for all of eternity, and I'll just zip through these. These are review from last week. What is the church? Not a building. All too often, that's what comes to mind. Um, and it's not a service, we say we're going to church, we often think of either A, we're going to a place, or B, we're going to a service. But what we're doing on a Sunday morning is gathering with the church in the church house. We're gathering with the church in the building that we happen to meet in. At the time, we've chosen to meet for the purpose we've chosen to meet. And there's two ways the word church is used in the New Testament. One is for the universal church and the other is for the local church. The universal church being global in expanse, it's all those who have personally trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Um, and it's made up of all the saints from the New Testament period all the way to the rapture. So it's still being built in, from a human standpoint, still being populated 
But the local church is how that word is most often used, referring to a local church. Out of the 115 times that the Greek word ekklesia, which is our word translated church, um, is used, 94 of those times refer to the local church. 94 times refer to the local church. And so it's referring to the kind of situation that you and I are in right now as part of a local church. Now, um, I want to uh, remind you of, a, of, a, uh, of what, what makes up the local church. It's a, it's a geographically limited group. It's just what the word means, local, a local gathering of Christ body. And I gave you this definition that I borrowed from, from Nathan Knight. Um, a regular gathering of believers who have covenanted together under biblical leadership to preach the gospel, portray the gospel, and protect the gospel. A regular gathering of believers who have covenanted together under biblical leadership to preach the gospel, portray the gospel, and protect the gospel. And so my, my, and my, and my plan is in these, these weeks ahead, these messages that, that we're going to be having, we're going to unpack all those different ideas of preaching the gospel, portraying the gospel, and protecting the gospel. And um, we're going to go from the broad idea of church down to the specific idea of what, are the, what is unique about Elamsport Baptist. What, what does it mean to be part of the First Baptist Church of Elamsport? What are our membership standards and what are our values and what, uh, what are ways that we uniquely as, as a, a group of people in rural uh, Pennsylvania era 2024, what are the unique ways that we seek to live out God's purposes, God's plan for the church? We're going to talk about what God's plan is today, but then eventually we'll talk about how we seek to live that out here in Elamsport and in the way we worship and do church together. The early church began here in Acts chapter 2. And if you're not already there, please, please turn there with me. Now, Acts chapter 2 is a pretty long chapter, and I'm just going to take a high-level uh, view of it and focus in a little on the end. But I want you to think about the context of Acts 2. It's, it's so important that we understand the context of any passage of Scripture that we look at. So if you can, in your mind, go with me back to... The days following the resurrection. So we know that Jesus was crucified, right? On the cross. He died. He was buried. Three days later on what we call Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, he rose from the dead. And then he was on earth with his disciples. We only hear a little bit about that, right? You know, the gospels are like this long. And then the crucifixion, and then a chapter or two to what happens after the resurrection. And, um, and but, but how long was that period till Jesus ascended to heaven, do you know? 40 days. 40 days he was here on earth with his disciples, and, and those were uh, epiphany days. I mean, they were finally starting to see and understand all those things Jesus taught them for those couple of years that they walked with him and, and ate with him and slept with him and watched him minister to the crowds and, they, and he ministered to them individually. It was finally coming together. And for 40 days, he got to help them put all those pieces together. But one of the things that Jesus said to them right before he was crucified is he said, um, don't be, I'm going to leave you, and don't be sad when I leave you because I need to leave you so that what could happen? The Comforter, the Holy Spirit will come. And here's a verse that, that maybe has left you scratching your head lots of times, but in John, he said to them, greater things he said, I've done these great things. You've seen me do these great things. You are going to do greater things. What does that mean? Well, I think Acts chapter 2 is kind of the explanation of what that means, the fulfillment of what that means. Keep that in mind. Let me back up a little bit to the context. 
So 40 days, Jesus goes to heaven. Now that he said, stay in Jerusalem, wait for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. So for the next few days, they're in the upper room. They're praying. They choose, they felt like they needed to choose a replacement for Judas. They do that. And, uh, and, and all that happens in chapter 1 of Acts chapter 1. And then they come to the day of Pentecost. 50 days after the Passover. So about a week from when Jesus ascended, they're at the temple. And, and this is what happens. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a great mush, a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them excuse me, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon them, on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation, devout men from every nation. Um, and uh, these have a slide here. I guess I have it out of order. Um, but just in the, a picture of all the places where all these, these different, different men came from, these different people, gathered because it's Pentecost. These, you have this whole season of, of important holy days where they gather at Jerusalem. So the city is filled with out-of-town folk that have come to worship God under the Jewish law on the day uh, at this whole time period, um, Pentecost, and prior to that, there was Passover. And so um, it says there were devout men from every nation under heaven, verse 6. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? These are a bunch of rednecks, and all of a sudden they became multilingual. They're speaking in our language. But we know it's a miracle, right? We know back it explained it in verse 4 that the Holy Spirit gave them the power to speak in the native tongues of all these people. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. And so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Now others mocking said, they're full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. A little bit of a change in Peter, isn't it? This is the Peter that said, I don't know who Jesus is, and denied him. But he's standing up in front of this crowd. And, and um, back when we looked at the book of Acts, I, I described to you how big the temple mound was. I mean, we have this huge, vast plaza with, with portico all the way around it, and then the temple. And the, big, the biggest area, the big open area, plaza area was, was open to all people, to, to Gentiles and, and women, and they could all be there to worship God. And all along the sides were the, the porches, big pillars with a roof over them, so you could kind of get in and out of the sun, and, and they would meet there, and the different rabbis would hold their classes there, and, and the Sanhedrin could meet there, and all that sort of thing. They're at the temple, and this happens, and all of a sudden, all these people gathered they hear the noise, they see what's going on, everybody gathers around that was, was there to worship that day to hear what in the world's going on. And Peter speaks out and he says, listen to me, verse 15, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. And this is a quote from the, from the book of Joel. You can look it up in the Old Testament there that I will pour out of my 
I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, and you crucified him and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, and now we're going to start another Old Testament quote from the book of Psalms. So we've already heard from Joel, verses 17 through 21 of Acts chapter 2 is a quote from the book of Joel, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. Now, verses 25 through 28 is a quote from David, from the Psalms. And, and David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. That's Yahweh, that's the personal name of God, the covenant name of God with Israel. Not a title, but a name. Lord, always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of joy in your presence. Peter's point in quoting that passage is to demonstrate that the resurrection and the reality and God's ability to resurrect from the dead was already talked about back in the Psalms. He's talking to a crowd that knows the Old Testament, and he's showing them that Jesus is the fulfillment of He's not teaching some strange new religion. He's teaching them what the Old Testament's been saying right along. And so then Peter says this. He's done quoting, and he says in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, talking about King David, um, that he's both dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, from the fruit of his body, According to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, again, quoting from the Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord, that's a title, Adonai, it's a, the master, he's made him Lord, the ruler, has made him Lord and Christ. The Greek word for Messiah, the New Testament word for Messiah, the, he, the Old Testament Hebrew idea of this anointed one coming. Jesus is both of those things, Lord of the universe, of the world, Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel. Now, I want you to think about this a minute. If you were an Israelite, that less than two full months earlier was at Pilate's gate chanting, crucify him. You were filled with indignation against Jesus along with all the rest of the mob around you. Whether you were knowledgeably filled with hate like the Pharisees were, or whether you were just going along with the crowd like a crowd at a ball game, you're being told that that Jesus, that you celebrated his crucifixion, 
He was the Messiah that you were raised all your life to look for. The Old Testament Messiah and the God of the universe. That's who you helped kill. Just think about being in that situation. The impact of how that would hit you. Look what it says in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do we do? What do we do? I mean, have you ever been so convinced of an idea that you wouldn't let anybody speak sense to you? Like you just kept shutting them off. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do it. And then somehow you, you suddenly either stop talking long enough to listen or you just, in your mind, you reflect on what they said and all of a sudden you realize you were wrong and they were right. And the question is, how do I undo that? What do I do? That's what they're saying. And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the, what's the, 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 the thing to do? To repent. To confess that you were wrong, that you had Jesus all wrong, that you've been ignoring parts of the Old Testament that were being unfolded right in front of your eyes. And to cry out for forgiveness to Jesus. To, to put your trust in him. And there's a promise. You'll, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. You'll become part of God's family. For this promise, verse 39, is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. There's no longer political borders. There's no longer geographical borders. There's no longer ethnic borders. There's no longer gender borders. That whoever God draws to himself will be saved from, from all these. And that's why, you know, we just looked at that verse from Peter that I read for you. He goes on, and, and look at all the categories that are covered in 1 Peter chapter 2. You're a race. You're a, a royal lineage now. Um, I mean, a royal priesthood. You're a, a holy nation. You're God's own people. You are a member of the household of God. You have a brand new identity. It has nothing to do with your gender, with your socioeconomic class, with your ethnicity, with your geographical location. Your identity is completely changed. You're one of God's children now. And the reason I want to take so much time to drive that home is we are looking at a people who celebrated their identity as Jews, their identity in being a child of Abraham. And then more specifically, some of them celebrated their identity of, I am a rabbi of the school of Gamaliel or whoever. I belong to this, to, you, to compare it to our day, I belong to this political party. I belong to this ethnicity. And that's what they built their identity on, and it just all got turned upside down. And everything they believed and valued, well, I shouldn't say everything, but a lot of what they built their life on was changed. Now, we go back. Remember, it said these were devout men. These were people who thought they were faithfully following God's word. That's why they, were, they, they knew the Old Testament. That's why they were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They felt that they were devout followers of Yahweh. And they just found out they had some major details wrong. But there's something else that happened. When they changed their identity in Christ, it also meant that they were going to be rejected by all those institutions that they had their identity in. And I think one of the reasons that we get the idea of church wrong as 21st century Christians in America is we don't know what it's like to experience the rejection that they experienced at that moment when they chose to follow Jesus. Let's look what happened next just uh, real quick. Um, Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse 
generation. He preached for a while. They didn't have time to write it all down. And uh, he said, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. People from all over the world, all the way up to Rome, down into Africa, north into Asia Minor, and even east into Mesopotamia and into what we would call Iraq and Iran and that area of the world. People getting saved from all over. And uh, so, in one day, we went from a handful of disciples that could fit in one room, men and women, followers of God, most of them composed of those original 11, but, but others. We went from that group to 3,000 international followers in one afternoon or one morning. These disciples became open followers of the man they had helped crucify not even a full two months earlier. And so what do they do? In verse 41, those who gladly received his word were what? They were baptized. They were baptized. They were immersed. It was a statement of identification, a statement of identification with Jesus. They made it public there on that temple mound around all their peers that they were followers of Jesus. They followed Peter's command. He said, repent and be baptized. Identify with Jesus. And that's why we have a baptistry in our church. Because we believe, and this is, this is attested in other parts of the, Old, of the New Testament, the idea of being immersed in it. And it's explained out in Romans and Ephesians about identifying with Jesus and identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection, new life in Christ, the, the dunking down into the water and coming back up just like Jesus died and was buried and he rose again. We have new life in Christ. And when they made that statement in front of the, and, and there were baptistry tanks at the temple, down, down underneath, as you went up the stairs, there were entrances because the idea of, of washing and of baptism were already part of the Jewish faith. But now it had a new statement, a new meaning. And there was also a lot of people that knew about John's baptizing. Not at the temple, but out at the river, baptizing, getting ready for Christ. A baptism of repentance, to wash, to demonstrate putting off the sins that you had been living. And so they get baptized. That's, it's important. And you notice that's in the Great Commission too, isn't it? That we're to go preach the gospel and do what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To demonstrate who they are in Christ. To demonstrate their identity with him. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Because you're a chosen race now. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim his excellencies, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are now, as it says in Ephesians, a member of the household of God. So the local church is made up of baptized, professing Christians. Baptized, professing Christians. The idea of baptism, even though I think it's taken some incorrect forms in multiple different um, denomination traditions, is still part of it. Even those who don't even hold to the true gospel still see baptism. There's the, 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 it is so important that it still remains central even when other things get corrupted. The church is made up of baptized. If you're not willing to identify with Christ in the tank, you're not willing to really identify with Christ. That that's a center point. And for us, it has a small price. In fact, in our church, and, and in many churches, it's a celebration time. But for those who were of the first century church, it was often 
the beginning of a lot of hardship, of being shunned, of being excommunicated, of being disowned. You quite likely would lose your identity and your association with all those peers that were on the Temple Mound that weren't joining you. There's a good chance if your family didn't follow in faith that they would disown you as a member. And that's why it's so important to realize that we are now members of the church of God. And so coming to a local church is not just a casual activity. It is an ongoing statement that I am one of Christ. And I believe it was Jay Adams that put it this way. He says, you need to become a member so we know how to treat you as a believer versus an unbeliever. And so we come and it's made up, of the local church is made up of saved, baptized Christians. Organized under biblical leadership. We'll talk about biblical leadership in a church in another week or in another message or two down the road um, is, is where we're headed there. But I want to focus in on what the local church did. What did the local church do when they, when they came together, when they started meeting, the idea of meeting together, the idea of worshiping God, the idea of teaching? You know, think about what we do here on a Sunday morning. We, we come together, we meet together. <clears throat> Part of our service involves prayer. We have singing. Now, it's interesting, we don't see singing here specifically spelled out, although it talks about them praising God. And, 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 and we know both from, from um, extra biblical history and from the Old Testament and then from the New Testament letters that Paul wrote, singing is and should be part of the local church. Um, and, and it's a way to express and to proclaim the praises of God. It's the way we teach each other. Um, did you like any of those songs we sang this morning? Aren't, aren't there some great, rich words in, in, in what you could call modern hymns? Um, Behold our God and, um, and the, uh, uh, um, what is our hope? And, 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 even, and, the, and then a more contemporary expression and, and anchor, but, but still speaking biblical truth to each other about God being our hope. He's our hope both in life and death. He's our anchor when the storms of life are threatening to drown us. We feel like we're being crushed, we're being washed away, we can't get our breath, that Christ is the anchor we hold on to. And so, so singing does the dual purpose of both proclaiming God's praises, but teaching each other God's praises. And God has made music such a beautiful thing that, that even outlasts strokes and, and such that, that it's in our minds and we can, and it just brings those truths back connected with the beauty and the emotional power of the tune that they were sung to. Um, and so that, that's part of it. But look at, I just want to recap this really quick and, and we don't obviously have time to dig in the detail, but the first thing they did is they were baptized to identify with Christ. Baptized to identify with Christ, verse 41. And, and, and let me, well, and then in verse 42, it says they continued steadfastly, and that modifies everything else that follows in that verse, okay? So they continued steadfastly, first in the apostles' teaching. And I have here in my notes, and I realize I never put it into a slide for you, but there was two things we need to realize about chapter 2 of Acts. That first of all, the early church was very clearly founded on the preaching of the Word of God. The early church was founded on the preaching of the Word of God. Isn't that what Peter did? He preached, and he preached from Scripture. Which Scriptures did he use? I told you two books of the Old Testament he quoted from. Yeah, Joel and Psalms. And he also retold a lot of Jesus' words that weren't written down and canonized as Scripture yet, but the truths of Christ. So the early church was founded on the preaching of the Word of God, but here's something, I, I referencing back to that verse in John where it says, in, in greater things than these you will do, and be glad that I'm leaving so the Holy Spirit can come. Did Jesus, in all his preaching, the Sermon on the Mount, the feeding of the 5,000, all those things, do we have recorded that 3,000 people came converted to him 
in those times? You see, Jesus' teaching made an impact and it was important, but it's not till we get to the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit that we see 3,000 people converted from one message. That they put their trust in Christ. You know, I remember reading um, in the Gospels, um, and I forgot to remind myself where this was, but Jesus, it said, Jesus knew the hearts of men. He wasn't always that excited by the followers that were with him because a lot of them were just along for the show. A lot of them were just curious and they were undecided. There were true followers, but they were in the minority. And so we see through the word of the Holy Spirit. So first of all, the early church was founded on the preaching of the word of God. Second, the early church was clearly formed by the working of the Holy Spirit of God. It was formed by the working of the Holy Spirit of God. In the hearts of Peter and the apostles, both the miracle of speaking in other languages they didn't know, but also the fact that Peter boldly speaks. And then in the hearts of listeners, because it requires God granting repentance for people to churn. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, being dead in our trespasses and sins, being deceived by the lies of Satan, we don't choose Christ on our own. That we need the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, to open our blind eyes, and to grant repentance to us. And so the Holy Spirit was working hard. And they got saved, they accepted the gospel results, and identified with God's people. So they were steadfast in the apostles' teaching. They're like, tell us more. There's so much we don't know from the Old Testament. You know, it's exciting to sometimes get to teach people that have not heard good teaching. I used to go to White Deer back when, when, when um, Margie worked at the partial over by the giant. And I got to go once a week and have that, you know, 50 minutes or an hour to teach. And I never, it was always hard to know what to do for that Bible study because I could walk into a room of four people that I'd never seen before. Next week, I could walk into a group of 15 people. Two of them were there last week. The other ones, never saw them before. And then the third week, I might have half the room is full of people that already were there the week before. So it's like there was no continuity. I couldn't start a series. I always kind of had to do standalone. And my priority always was, no matter what passage of Scripture I was teaching from, I was going to share the gospel. And I don't know how many people would tell me they had some kind of church background, but they never heard the gospel explained so plainly. And they were just amazed at it. Not because I'm anybody special, but I just explained what the Bible says so clearly. And other times you get a chance, and, and I imagine, I mean, Henry has given testimony of this, of, of speaking to people that are just hungering for God's truth, that some of them have been corrupted by horrible doctrine. And, and to hear what God's word really says about church leadership and godly leadership and servant leadership and, and, and the hope of the gospel and the power being in God's word and its sufficiency. We should always be hungry for God's word. I remember one of my professors was like 80 or so. No, not exaggerating. He was at least 80. I might have been 83. And he, he wasn't done studying God's word. He had written a theology book about this thick. He had written another small book. He wasn't done discovering the riches of God's word. He hadn't lost his excitement of studying and teaching. And being under God, the teaching of God's word, is bread and butter to a Christian. You will not grow, you will not mature, if you do not get fed God's truth on a regular basis. Well, the, remember I said the steadfast continuing steadfastly, that modifies all these activities. They were in fellowship with one another. They spent time together. It tells us they met daily in the temple and from house to house. They were always getting together. They ate and celebrated communion together. Now, there's some debate there, but they broke bread together, and it seems that that was not just eating a meal, but that the, the early church was in the habit of doing communion, like, constantly, constantly. 
that, that Paul had to correct some of their, that they had this ongoing love feast and, and that they did maybe weekly or on a regular basis and, and they got off the tracks on that. We talk about that in 1 Corinthians 11 whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But it was, the, it's the general understanding that this isn't just eating a meal together, but it probably is also indicating they celebrated communion together regularly. They steadfastly prayed together. We said that the church started with two ingredients, the preaching of God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit. A lot of churches get into trouble when they forget about the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, God's made some incredibly talented people that could teach God's word so well and impress so many people and move you I was listening to one the other day, and he confessed that a big piece of his ministry, he was doing it all on his own strength. He wasn't dependent on God. He, he was, it wasn't that it was deliberate arrogance, but he was just busy. And he had lost connection with God himself. And all of a sudden, he realized, you know, I'm not doing this for God. I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it in God's strength. I'm doing it in mine. And many times, God has to wake us up to that fact. We need to stop trying to live life on our own, stop trying to do things in our own power. They steadfastly prayed together. It goes on, and they said they shared things in common. They had all things in common. And uh, there was, remember, you have people from all over the world that traveled there, and all of a sudden, they got saved, and they're staying there, and they're fellowshipping, and their home and their business are 100 miles away. And the city was full of poor people under Roman leadership and oppression back then, too. And so you have these people, you had the hads and the, the haves and the have-nots, and it said that they had all things together in common, verse 44. They sold possessions and goods, divided them among all as any had need. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, that's repeated again, they eat, ate their food with gladness and, and singleness or simplicity or integrity, a single focus of heart. It's all about God. It was all about pleasing Jesus. It was all about following him, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. How did the church grow? By the Lord adding daily to the church those who were being saved. I gave you this big overview of Acts 2 because it's foundational to what we're going to talk about with all the activities the church should be doing. If the existence of the church is not centered around these things, then we need to reevaluate what we're doing. Are we really a church of God? Do we understand what that means? Where's our identity? It all starts with who we are. We are not gods that God should be advancing our agendas. He is God and we are his servants. We're members of his household here to advance his agenda. And he's told us, here's the game plan, how to grow, how to follow me, how to fulfill the Great Commission. We want to pay attention to that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you that you haven't called any of us to live life on our own. That is not your plan. But rather, you made us part of your family. Both, we have both you with us at all times. In the form of the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, in the form of an all present God who is everywhere and sovereign over all. But you've given us fellow humans to walk this earth together with. It is not your intention that we are lone rangers on our own, but you've put us into this family with other believers, other Christ followers as our brothers and sisters, and we're to help each other. We're to grow together. We're to encourage each other to love and good works. Help us, Lord, to follow your plan and to remember our identity. In Jesus' name, amen.